Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Welcome back, adapters. On today's episode, I have Suzanne Pardo, a climate change researcher at the Ontario Centre for Climate Impacts and Adaptation Resources. I also have Dan Ackerstein on, where we talk about the potential shift from mitigation to adaptation at many of the federal agencies. Please stick around. Hey, Adapters, welcome back to this week's episode. Like I said, I have Suzanne Pardo on today. What's very exciting about that is Suzanne is my first international guest. She's representing Ontario, Canada. I welcome her to America Adapts. It, it was a fun recording. I learned a lot about what they're doing up in Canada and what a, what is being a young professional starting off in adaptation, what that's all about. I also have Dan Ackerstein on. There was a recent article talking about how the EPA and potentially other agencies might shift their emphasis on mitigation of carbon emissions to adaptation. That doesn't sound good, but at the same time, you know, we discuss what are some of the opportunities associated with dealing with adaptation if, if that's the case. It's, it's still early if that actually is going to mean anything. All right, just before we get started, just want to remind you that there is a Facebook page for America Daps, and there's a community group where we have chats, and it's fun. We share information and people keep joining that just go on facebook and look for america daps and you, it'll show up also some upcoming guests it's just going to be an amazing probably four to six weeks of guests coming up i have john sutter from cnn's two degrees and we're going to talk about his show and how he talks about climate change i have Catherine mock from the stanford institute who is an adaptation researcher i have judge alice hill who's going to come on and talk about national security at the obama White House. And so we'll talk about how they approached it. And the first time we will have talked about national security. I have Amy Brady, who is actually, this is super cool, a literary critic uh, focusing on, on books and essays. And there's a whole new emerging field of climate science fiction called Cli-Fi. And she's going to come on and talk about Cli-Fi. I, I have never heard of it. And it's this big, amazing new field. And I have Andrew Lewin, who actually is from another podcast, Speak Up for Blue who focuses on cons ocean conservation. So as you can see, the next month is going to have some amazing guests on it. Other housekeeping, yeah, just don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. If you're hearing this, you're listening to your iPhone, just hit that subscribe and it'll show up. And there's also an America Daps app. You just can go on Google Play and search for it or on iTunes in your app store. Just search for America Daps and it's free and it just allows you a bit more functionality as you're listening to the podcast. And again, I want to encourage you to contact me. Every week I hear from people, and, and I love it. I, I hear what you're up to or what you're doing, and you don't even have to be in the adaptation field. Just love hearing from you and mention you on the podcast on occasion. And so, yeah, please, and just at my website, americaadapts.org, and my email is there, and it's just americaadapts at gmail.com. And I would, again, love to hear from you. And if you are the media and you have any questions, you can contact me too. And on that note, let's jump right into this episode. Again, this is Suzanne Pardo, and it's going to be followed up by a shorter discussion with Dan Ackerstein on the future of adaptation at federal agencies. Hey, adapters, welcome back to another fantastic episode of America Adapts, the climate change podcast. On today's episode, I have Suzanne Perdo, climate change researcher at the Ontario Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Resources. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Doug. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. You're my first international guest. We've gone international now, so that's very exciting for me. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm really happy to represent Canada. <laughs> Your main guy, the Prime Minister Trudeau, he came to visit us. I think, I mean, when people listen to this, it'll have been a couple of weeks, but he came to visit the U.S. Was that pretty big news up there? Yes, yes and no. I think the biggest thing that came out of it was uh, video clips of the handshake, yes. the infamous <laughs> handshake. <laughs> and Canadians were like, yes, go Trudeau, represent. <laughs> oh, what do you mean Canadians? It, uh, most Americans, too. I mean, apparently, <laughs> apparently Trump has this, and we're not going to get political here. I don't want to do that too much. But apparently Trump, I didn't realize this, had a reputation of kind of doing this kind of throttling handshake. And so uh, the, the prime minister came in, and he just gripped it tight so it was like a normal handshake. So that was pretty funny. Yeah, that was funny. And they're referencing his, like, yoga poses and his yoga training that he has. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> He's a cool guy. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> we look at him fondly these days. And so I want to just kind of set this up for what, what we're going to talk about in this podcast. So we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about some of the amazing work on adaptation that you're doing up in Ontario and not just what you're doing, what, you know, the whole region's doing, what Canada's doing. And then I want to talk a bit about your background. You're a relatively young adaptation professional, and I think that's probably really interesting for a lot of people getting into the field and then, you know, kind of end it with like maybe giving, asking you questions and your advice on people kind of moving forward there. So um, that's what I thought we'd talk about. That sounds good to me. All right. Okay. First off, Americans are terrible about Canada. And first of all, it's just like this safe, lovely place. But most of us don't know anything about it except for all the comedians that kind of moved to Hollywood. And <laughs> what is Ontario like? I mean, I, I don't even know anything about Ontario. Hmm. So I recently moved to northeastern Ontario. So OKR is located in Sudbury. Uh, so it's about four hours north of Toronto. And honestly, before I moved here, I didn't even know how big Ontario really is. So, like, the I think three quarters of Ontario is in southern Ontario. Um, but, I mean, they go as north, like, really north. Um, there are more remote communities, and that's where a lot of our First Nations uh, communities are located. But, yeah, not a lot of people really think past Toronto. And so it's a huge geographical range but uh so we have a lot of the manufacturing industry in southern ontario uh we've got toronto with the financial hub and we've got main airport and then sudbury and northern ontario there's a lot of mining sector here we've got the big nickel in sudbury it's kind of an I iconic uh symbol to represent uh, all the nickel deposits and that's that's how sudbury came about yeah ontario is awesome it's sparse there's a lot to see we have a lot of uh parks and trails and uh, I think Sudbury region has the most lakes in all of Ontario or Canada it has like over 300 lakes so there's always lots to do so uh, our, our winters are brutal but the summer's really nice you can go swimming and canoeing and it's it's great I'm originally from Florida, and I think D.C. winters are brutal, and there you are up in Ontario, and I'm sure it's a whole different. So I just imagine when I think of Canada, it's, it's just covered with trees. So are, are there a lot of hills and trees in, in Sudbury, that region? <laughs> yeah, so Sudbury, the geography really changes. You can notice it as you drive north of Toronto, uh, and we're on the Canadian Shield up here. So there's a lot more rocks, and, and actually Sudbury's – a pretty amazing kind of environmental story. So a lot of the land got really decimated with their old mining practices and they reforested it. They took a really um, aggressive approach and now it's just covered in trees and green space and it's really healthy. It has some of the cleanest air in all of Ontario. Whereas I think in the 1960s, there would be, I've heard stories where there would be garages where you go and get your car repainted because the acid and the rain from the mining industry would just wash it away. They've done a lot of really good work here. But yeah, for the most part, Ontario is relatively flat. Once you go to um, like Alberta and, and the West Coast, there's more mountains and lots to do. Come visit Sudbury. Well, you know, when I look at maps, I've only been to Quebec City, which was just beautiful, just a mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful area. But uh, I have lots more to travel in Canada. So you've inspired me. So I want to jump into the the work that you're doing. And you had an act. You named the acronym, and I didn't know how to pronounce it. It's OKR. OK, how do you say that? OKR. OKR. Mm -hmm. All right. I've done a little bit of homework on that, but could you kind of explain what is the group? I mean, what's the sort of setup there? Yes, we're essentially a university-based research center. Uh, so Laurentian University is the big university in Sudbury. And OKR has an interesting setup. So we sit in a mining and innovation research center called Morarco for short. The full name is Mining Innovation Rehabilitation and Applied Research Corporation. Uh, and so they were founded in 1998. They're a not-for-profit. It, but Laurentian University um, is a shareholder in it. And then so OKR is one of the research set groups within Morocco. We do climate change work and we're, we're pretty independent of mining, though. We don't have focus on mining heavily or there's no kind of specific 
focus for mine. We do a lot of diverse work. So OKR has a staff of five full time. One of them is located out of office in Ottawa. Yeah, so OKR, basically, we're dedicated to developing and delivering resources on climate change impacts and adaptation. We, since 2001, we've completed more than 50 five zero projects on impacts and adaptation. And we've partnered with all kinds, municipal, provincial, federal governments, conservation authorities, First Nations, quite a range of industry. We've done a lot of workshops. We've had, I'd say, over 100 appearances and hosted over 30 workshops. And when we get a project, if We want to help the, I guess, the client or whoever we're working for. Essentially, the end goal is to help them adapt to climate change. You know, we want to reduce or mitigate the damage caused by climate impacts, prevent any further damage, and then also take advantage of new opportunities. So this could vary from helping them just communicate the climate, the science of climate change. It could be increasing their adaptation knowledge and awareness. It could be promoting communication resource tools and material, or even doing uh, research. We could do collect and research information, do vulnerability assessments, risk assessments, maybe develop and implement regional adaptation plans. Kind of the list goes on. We Yeah, so we create case studies, data sheets, fact sheets, reports. It's all over. So where do you get your funding from? You're not a government entity. So like, how are you funded? Right. We're project based. We have funding from Natural Resources Canada. So that's the federal government, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. So there would be our provincial Ministry of Environment, maybe conservation authorities, and then sometimes local um, municipalities, for example, might hire us on to do a vulnerability assessment. Well, you, you're, you said you're a pretty small shop. I think there's five of you. And so let's say you're doing a vulnerability assessment. I can't imagine your staff being able to do all those different things that you said. So I guess, do you partner with, with the universities, like the pro- grant money, or are you guys literally doing all those things? So I guess it depends on the project, but partnering is huge for us. So we partner with like private sector um, and then a lot of different agencies and ministries in the province have like a list of all of those we've we've partnered with. You don't have to say them all, though. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a few choice ones you really want to share, that's good. Usually that's what will happen. Risk Sciences International, they're a group in Ottawa, and we partner with them on a few projects. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we usually work together to, to get the job done. Is there an equivalent of your group in every uh, territory in Canada? Hmm, that's a good question. I would say... I would say there's no other group like us in Ontario. Say we are the leading adaptation organization. But then there are different, very similar, but different groups working in Canada. So Simon Fraser University in BC, they have an adaptation group and then they do work through them. Yeah, it's it's every province has their own groups working for them. I mean, it seems like you're relatively new there, but it's even the entity is relatively new. And the concept of adaptation, is that a struggle when you're kind of maybe working with areas that, I guess, need planning? Do they get what you even mean when you come in and you say adaptation? Yeah, so, I mean, most of those who come to us for support, they have a climate change adaptation champion already. So... Glencore, for example, they're a mining company in Sudbury, and we did some climate change for them a few years ago. And so they they had somebody who recognizes this, and they have support from management. So that's usually what happens. So far, we haven't worked with any projects where it was a struggle to get them to convince them to do adaptation work. Most of the work we do is that they recognize it's an issue, they're experiencing impacts, and they need support to help mitigate them or plan for them. We were talking about other territories having this, but is there a national level adaptation office? Yes. So that would be under Natural Resources Canada. So Natural Resources Canada is the um, like the federal department 
for our natural resources. <laughs> so the federal government's Department of Natural Resources, that's what operates under the name of Natural Resources Canada. And they, in 2012, they established the Canada's Climate Change Adaptation Platform. And this is a national forum that brings together groups in Canada to collaborate on climate change adaptation. And then this operates or is led by their Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Division. So they're the, the ones at the federal level who push forward the climate change adaptation agenda. Uh, so they have, that will include members of the adaptation platform from different representations, so federal, provincial, territorial governments, uh, some industry members. And, and so then they run and a, a lot of projects. So one of them is the regional adaptation collaboratives on here. And that runs in six regions across Canada. Ontario, OKR has been the host for Ontario for the last three. We're currently in on the, in the third installment that ends at the end of March. But the RAC has invested a lot of money into adaptation programs. Uh, RAC 2, which w- ran from 2011 to 2016, that was an investment of $140 million over those five years across the six regions. So that helped to mainstream adaptation into their federal decision making. So essentially they have hosts in the six regions and then they deliver adaptation projects and activities. So OKR, it helped OKR really enhance the capacity of Ontario's communities and our sectors to prepare for climate change. So RAC 3 right now, we're focused on specific sectors. So we're focused on forestry, mining, infrastructure, municipal planning, and energy. And so we're doing different activities like webinars, informational sheets on those sectors, Workshops. We're going to be holding two workshops in March, one on risk, risk assessment and one in the mining sector. And the goal is really to coordinate climate change adaptation projects and planning and decision making and help to spur it at the community level. So it's been really a great catalyst for moving adaptation in Ontario. What we probably should have done is maybe just kind of step back and just, we could just do this briefly, but what exactly are the kind of big climate change impacts that you are dealing with in Ontario? I mean, I'm just visualizing you probably go all the way up to the Arctic Ocean, but I mean, sea level rise, drought, I mean, what are the big ones? So as you can imagine, a lot of the climate changes in Canada are being magnified by the Arctic. So average temperatures in the Arctic are increasing at a rate that are nearly three times the global average. And so in Canada as a whole, we've really experienced an an annual surface air temperature increase of about 1.5 degrees Celsius just between 1950 and 2010. So these these changes, the, the largest magnitude of change are occurring in the north. And then also the west western parts of Canada are experiencing some pretty drastic increases. And then precipitation, about 16% increase in average annual precipitation between that same time period. And I think the a lot of these are really presenting themselves in extreme weather events. So temperature changes, wind, um, hurricanes and storms. It's especially in Ontario, it's we're experiencing a lot of extreme weather events and these are costing a lot <laughs> to the economy. I think there was recently a an article that came out that said that it broke Canada's natural disasters broke the record for previous years in insurance claims. I mean, in Ontario, we're seeing the same thing. So we're seeing an increase in temperature and the far north, they could see increases by as much as 10 degrees by the end of the century. Our frost-free season is increasing about 1 to 13 days each decade in Ontario. And then this is also affecting a lot of our ecosystems. So the Great Lakes, I know November, the lakes were the warmest they've been in 16 years. And so that carries on into the spring and into the summer when the lake doesn't get cold enough that increases evaporation and so we're likely going to expect low lake water uh, levels in the summer and then that affects industry that affects hydropower and then also even our fish species so they are used to a certain temperature and when they can't 
adapt that quickly. We're seeing a lot of fish species just die. It's, it's pretty drastic. I think our heat waves, we're having fewer cold spells. I think thawing permafrost as well is a big issue, especially in the north. So for First Nations, they, they rely on ice roads to get their, to get their supplies in the winter. And when those don't freeze over, they don't get those supplies. They have nothing coming in. And so then we're seeing increases in the cost to fly in that food. So now, now that's cascading over to their ability to afford a meal. It's, we're seeing kind of these interdependencies between sectors as well. And that's a big issue that our RAC3 program wants to address as well with our upcoming risk assessment workshop. As you described all these impacts, I, I imagine in Canada, it is much more front and center because, you know, we hear a lot about the impacts up in Alaska, coastal Alaska, and they, they really experience the, more of the temperature extremes. But to be quite honest, I think a lot of people in the lower 48 just they're like, well, that's Alaska. This sort of out of sight, out of mind. But I'm in Canada. Mm -hmm. You're right there. You're most of the probably territories are have p portions in the Arctic Circle. So that's right. Yeah, it's very uh, sobering, I'm sure, to deal with that. Do, well, I guess my next question is, does I, I guess your average Canadian has a general sense of climate change? And I, I hope they're not, you know, as high level of skeptics as we have in the U.S. But what about this notion of adapting to climate change? Do you feel like more of the public is getting it up there? I, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that more people understand the concept of mitigation. And I think that's true for a lot of places. And maybe, and I think that's growing though. I think that there's a renewed focus, especially with the support of the provincial government and some of their policy documents. That's increasing, but Unfortunately, climate change, as you guys are experiencing in the U.S., is has been mixed with politics. So it's unfortunately become a partisan issue, and it shouldn't be. And so Ontario has signed on to the cap-and-trade program, and a lot of those costs are now being seen on people's bills. So it's being passed on to our natural gas bills and so forth. And the public, from what I'm experiencing, are taking that, not not recognizing the science of climate change, the threat of climate change, and seeing that monetary value and then blaming it on our, on our premier. And it's just, it's hard from an education standpoint to show that the root, that there's is a threat of climate change and that we, the, the more that we invest in preventing it, the more that we're going to, the, le the less that we're going to have to pay in, in costs and cleanup and insurance and so forth. So they're definitely, I think that's what OKR is working towards. We want to increase adaptation because if, mitigation doesn't happen quick enough, we need to adapt. We need to adapt no matter what. The earth is warming. It's going to continue to warm, even if we seize all of our emissions tomorrow. So I think there's more focus on the impacts, and that's leading to the conversation of adaptation. But in general, it's not enough. People don't know enough. They don't understand it. And again, it's being mixed with, with a lot of political kind of beliefs and, and their viewpoints. So. Well, it sounds like you got your work cut out for you there. Okay, Suzanne, I want to pivot a bit here. You, I think you've done a great job sort of explaining. I've <laughs> So much of this was filling in the blanks for me for what you guys are doing up in Canada. First off, you are an award-winning young professional. So tell, tell me a little bit about that. What, what, <laughs> what did you get to this award in? So that was the Top 25 Environmentalists Under 25 Award. Cool. Yeah, so that was awarded by Starfish Canada. They're a little, I think they're a nonprofit now, actually, based out in BC. And so they do, they don't just cover climate change. They do different environmental uh, stories. They they try to focus on solutions versus problems. So they'll do stories on success that a lot of initiatives across Canada. So, yeah, so they have this program every year called, um, you know, Recognizing Canada's Top 25 Environmentalists Under 25. And I uh, was awarded it in, 
I guess I got it for three years in a row. I don't know how wow. that was possible. The <laughs> first year, yeah, so the first year I was just approached and said that, you know, you're a candidate. Um, will you have a short interview with one of our staff? And I said, sure. And then I just talked about everything that I was doing. So my, I guess my interest in the environment started when I was a kid. So I grew up in a small town of Aurora, Ontario. It's it's growing now. It's not so small. But I was I was always seeing our green space and our open fields and our agricultural land get built over with development. And that that tore at my heartstrings because I was always very empathetic towards our environment, towards our our species and our trees and I even from a young age recognized their value in in our health in our economy so that grew into high school I joined uh, a little kind of volunteer group and then I joined more outside youth groups like the York Region Environmental Alliance did a lot of volunteer work went into university and did an environment and resource studies um, undergraduate program. And that was, I liked that because the program, because it was very flexible. You had a few required courses and then the rest were electives. So that allowed me to earn a specialization in environmental assessment. So I got a diploma in that. So I really wanted to get a nice rounded experience and education. So from the social sciences to the physical sciences. And at the same time, though, I was recognizing this gap in environmental studies in university programs where there weren't enough in the field experience. So they would have some field courses here and there, but I thought climate change, you know, a glacier, glacial melt, melt. Well, I want to see it. I don't want to read it on a PowerPoint or on the, on a screen. I want to actually go and experience it. So I did some research and I stumbled across this program called Wildland Studies. And they're actually based out in California. And they offer environmental field programs all across the world, from South Africa to um, some in Canada to New Zealand. And they're really quite incredible. So I applied for a program in Alaska in 2009. And so I spent two months in the bush of Alaska. We were based out of a really small town called McCarthy, and it was field work. It was raw field work. So I was able to learn how to key out species by actually having the species in front of me. So that was incredible. And my little research project with five others was studying glacial melt and glacier retreat. So we looked at five glaciers in the wrangell St. Elias National Park, and actually got to stand in front of them and GPS technology and tracked, basically measured the toe of the glacier and mapped it to where the, the last end of it was recorded in the 60s. And then we measured the difference. Yeah. And then after my undergrad, I was realized that I didn't really have a niche, that I learned kind of a little about a lot in the about the environment. And then the University of Waterloo, I heard they were coming out with this Masters of Climate Change program. And it's the first of its kind in North America. It's the only one available in Canada. I applied to that and I got accepted. So I was a part of the inaugural class, which started in 2013. And it was an incredible program, very intensive. It was just one year course based and it's designed around the three working groups of the IPCC. So there was the climate change science, the physical science, vulnerability impacts and adaptation, and then mitigation. So you have these three required courses. And then similar to my undergrad, the program is flexible. So you can choose your electives that you're most interested in. So I took a paleolimnology class. I took an advanced adaptation class, climate compatible development, natural hazards, a really a list of unique courses and then you had a choice to complete a major research paper or an internship so I chose the internship I knew I didn't want to go on to do uh, any more academic research Smart. 
Yeah, and I did that <laughs> at the University of Waterloo. They have a center there called the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change. And so I did a, a, a semester there, and then that finished my master's. And now I'm at OKR. <laughs> Okay, so there was a lot to unpack there. That, that that's quite an academic journey, very interesting. And then the the I didn't realize that the first of its kind at, at University of Waterloo. The and so how your master's programs ours are generally two years. And so what you were saying with your academic school year, and then there was a year of internship. So how long was the total master's? The master's was just one year, and that included the internship. So my internship was a semester long. Okay, just so we we have some year long, but typically that it might be two years in the U.S. So. You'd mentioned like there was the three sort of categories with the IPC and literally what was the coursework? I mean, what what would the name of a course be to cover those three areas of the IPCC? Right. So one of them would be, um, you know, introduction to vulnerability impacts and adaptation. Another one was just like mitigation. And then if you don't remember, that's OK. <laughs> I'm more interested, too, is that, okay, you're taking these courses, and if this is the first of its kind, I mean, when, when you sign up for it, did you have conversations with the professors there? Did there Was there talk of, like, what sort of jobs are you potentially going to be able to get out of this? Did they have a pipeline into companies and government entities that wanted people going through this program? Did that, that even come up to you as a student? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea behind the program, while it was why it was created, was to to train graduates, to train students in a wide range of discipline, coming from a wide range of disciplines. So, a lot of my classmates didn't come from environmental backgrounds. Some of them were architecture students, or they had a background in economics. And so the idea is it's like interdisciplinary, pull people from interdisciplinary backgrounds, train them in climate change, and then release them into the world. And they can go and work in different sectors and bring their climate change knowledge. So, I mean, climate change crosses so many different paths, so many sectors, so many regions. Like it's, it's everything. Climate change is everything. So that was a really interesting feature about it. I liked having that diversity and then. And that's the idea. That's the idea is to to have them trained in climate change and then it's specialized, but they can go and then get work in different areas. So policy, they could work in policy. They could go on to do more field work. So more like paleolimnology like I did or, yeah, different lots of different stuff, work in um, infrastructure, health, health impacts, really a broad range. I think these kind of programs are going to look radically different in the next five, 10 years, because even in the U.S., I've had this discussion with a few of the guests of like, how are universities sort of upgrading their climate change programs? And are they offering adaptation programs? Are they offering more of like climate change research? And then in the field of adaptation research, and I know that's what you do at the, the center there, but that in itself is, I think, a lot of folks don't even necessarily know what that is. And it, it's just mm -hmm. a emerging field, which is sort of exciting. But at the same time, if you're a young person kind of coming into the university, it's like, all right, where do I go? What direction do I head? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And if I, if I had it my way, every program in university would have a course on climate change. Because like I said, it touches on every single discipline, everything. You can't it's related to every part of your day, the food you eat, you know, the way you get around, kind of whether or not you're going to go to the hospital that year and get sick because, we you know, climate change is increasing, you know, vector borne diseases and even just floods, like the health impacts from floods, from sewer overflows. And it's so vast. And we really need to be advancing our knowledge base of our impacts and the risks to all of our sectors and and actually have people prepared in their field. So I recently bought a house, for example, last year, and I had a home inspector and I was asking him about flooding, overland flooding. And he just, he, I realized he, he didn't have any, any idea about some of the, the climate change impacts that were coming and how that was going to translate into weather changes and those risks to the house. So the different things, points of interest that he checks off, I realized like he has, he has no training to know 
how different aspects of a house are going to become at risk well, I, with, you, clim- with climate change. You probably threw him off when you asked him what was the sort of, you know, one meter sea level rise model for the house. And he just right. didn't know how to answer that. So, you, right. I mean, I, I think what you just described, how you're thinking about climate change is probably music to the ears of a lot of people. And, you know, again, I think that's the point of you r- relatively young professionals. Now you're thinking about it that way. And I think even some people who are in, involved with adaptation aren't quite thinking about it that broadly. And that's what I, I like to think I'm talking about on, on the podcast. But no, that's very encouraging. And so I don't know if you noticed, as you're dealing with people that are older than 35, if you looked at their LinkedIn pages and such, you know, you'll see things like been doing adaptation for 20 years <laughs> and it's like baloney. I mean, right. I started off in wildlife conservation in the 90s, late 90s, and, you know, I started doing this climate change work in the mid-aughts, and so I feel like I'm a long-time practitioner, but some of these people are just, they're just exchanging their previous experience and saying, now I've been doing adaptation, and there are a handful of people that literally have been doing this for a long time, but a lot of that's just baloney. It's a new field, it's an emerging field, and it's changing relatively quickly, so you are that first generation that are, it's it's baked into your early years. That's kind of exciting. It is exciting, and there's so much to learn. I have a master's of climate change, but I don't even consider myself a master because every day, like you say, it's changing. And we have different emissions paths that when people ask us, okay, so there's a high emission scenario, there's a low emission scenario, and all of these translate into different pretty significant differences in how the climate is going to change and how the environment's going to respond. And it's really hard because adaptation, we have to focus on adaptation as being flexible to accommodate each one of those emission scenarios. And I think that's an important aspect of adaptation. So in a way, it's it's flexible. And that's something that I, I like learning about. I like learning all the different ways that we can keep it that way and um, and address multiple issues at once. And yeah, it's really exciting. And it, oh, I, I, I've gotten messages on LinkedIn by youth who were in high school or in undergrad, and they ask me, tell me about this field. I, I'm interested. And it's it brings me so much joy to see that the that youth are considering this because I it was it was not easy for me. Like it was an incredibly hard road to get where I am. I can remember being in high school and saying, yeah, I'm going to go do an undergrad degree in environmental studies. And even then it was, well, what what does that look like? What kind of job will you get from that? You know, it was like you do sciences or you do business. And so even that from the get go, but I persisted and said, no, you know, I know what I want. I'm passionate about this. And then you try to enter climate change where there's even more resistance to it and a lot of questions still. So what do you do? What is adaptation? And another key kind of awareness building, I think, strategy is to show on people in Ontario and people in Canada and across the world that it's relatable to them, that it's not some abstract thing like climate change is here, we're seeing the impacts and those actually translate into local stories. And I think that that's important too, to show people exactly how they can be affected, that they are being affected, that islands in Prince Edward Island, communities there are having to relocate. They're going to be Canada's first climate uh, migrants and refugees because they're literally losing their land to the ocean. And that's that's exactly the kinds of stories I think we need to share to get people to understand and then to understand what we do in response and what some of those measures look like. What I would encourage you, and I don't know if your center does this, this is that I think a lot of companies and even nonprofits and government agencies don't understand what they need when it comes to adaptation. So even though you've gotten this degree and you've, you're getting it, it was great. You, you got your position that you do have, but mm-hmm. I, it would be good like a center like yours. It sounds like that's sort of what you do is like you work with 
businesses is sort of saying, what does it mean for them to do recruitment of adaptation professionals? Because here in the United States, you know, you hear a lot of environmental consultants, they're putting these position descriptions out and you read them and you're just like, what, what is this? They, because, you know, there, there'll be big federal government grants to do resilience projects on the coast. And it's just, you can tell the HR people and even the older managers don't quite get what they're looking for. And so I think mm -hmm. there's an opportunity for people like you to explain it to the powers that be of this is what it means to sort of recruit and have someone with this skill set. And I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, certainly. I know what you mean. There's kind of similarly similar to sustainability, climate change positions. Some are operating that way as well. So they kind of post these positions. And I actually did a market analysis, oh, I guess over a year ago of company of consulting companies in Canada, and if they were undertaking climate change work. And in that, I did an assessment of businesses, the private sector. And it's so fascinating to see some of the information on it, that there's the group of private companies who, yes, they recognize climate change, they recognize the risks to their industry, but they're not going to do anything about it. And then there are those who do see it, and they're going full speed ahead. And then there's others who are just denying it altogether. And it's tough. That's when you need a climate champion in those types of organizations. So to anyone who's working in a company and they want to bring this as forward as an agenda item, like do it. I've had to do that in a lot of my previous jobs. And you can get a lot of resistance, but it's such an important topic. And sometimes it can fuel other people to join in, and then that creates a movement within your within the company, and hopefully that gets up to upper management, and then they can they can address it. Susanna, I want to wrap this up relatively soon, but there's a couple more issues I, I'd like to just throw at you. But you had mentioned that out of school that, and I think this was offline too through an email, but you developed a network of your fellow students, and you guys are still relatively in touch with each other. And so, you know, maybe describe how that's been a resource for you. Oh, it's so good. It's funny because um, the director here at OKR, Al Douglas, he's no Facebook, no social media for him. But oh, brother. I have to say, like our organization does, but him personally, right? He doesn't. And I say, like, Al, oh, like every day I go on Facebook because the information that you get on your news feed all depends on who you're friends with, right? And my friends are people in the climate change field. And so I get some of the the most pertinent climate change information from them, the stories that they share, the work that they're doing. And so I love using social media and as a way to get my information. And my group of friends <laughs> who I met in my master's program, we were so close. Our, we were the inaugural year, and I think that really helped too, because we were going through this new program. We were kind of the guinea pigs in it, and there were some kinks that needed to be worked out, but we we got through it together, and we just built this bond. And we have a Masters of Climate Change Facebook group, and we still all post in it. We post, you know, like job openings. We post some of the surveys. So I, right now, under our RAC 3 program, we put out a survey to collect different adaptation stories in Ontario. You know, is your sector experiencing climate change impacts, and what are you doing about it? And I posted that on there, and then they're able to share it within their networks, and that's that's such a huge, a powerful means of spreading information and advancing um, adaptation. So we're really close. We stay in touch and I consider them to be like kind of with me. We're moving forward. We're this new generation of adaptation champions and climate change champions. And it's really exciting. I love it. I love it a lot. That is super cool. I love that. That's sort of an out come of of what your work was at, at uni and you know so the al is the name of your boss there al douglas yeah al, if he happens to listen to this it's al you're 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 missing out on fu <laughs> funny cat videos i mean two or three times a day there's these great and there's this 
great video of a chimp sniffing its butt or something that I show my two boys very frequently, and you're missing out on that. But uh, <laughs> no, seriously, I, I totally agree with this Facebook. You know, they're like everyone writes like a research or whatever institute or a conservation group. They're going to build the next big website that's going to be the storehouse of information, and everyone's going to post. And people are not using that stuff, but they are using Facebook. And there's enough flexibility that, I mean, you know, it, we both do it. You're, you're, commuting somewhere you're waiting and you're flipping through facebook or some of these social media sites and you're sharing information and it that's just the way it is and a lot of these like official website resources are becoming dead ends and i think a lot of people that don't use the social media are like you just described job postings or like research or whatever it's just it's now being shared on these and there might be something different in five years but right now i would recommend to anyone they're doing some adaptation project you know, create a Facebook page for it. Don't go right. create a website for it. That right. will not be used. And it doesn't transfer very well. So anyway, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir with you. It sounds like with the, you, your group that you just, you're taking full advantage of it. So, mm -hmm. hey, so another question for you, this is what I'm doing now on the podcast is that if you could recommend one, and you don't have to know the person, recommend one person to come to the podcast that if you know them, then you can introduce me. But if you don't know, I can try to track them down. But who would you want to come on America Daps? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, I I think – Don't say your boss because that's just real butt kissing there. So Right. I always, I always bring up Blair Feltmate. Blair Feltmate. Don't know this person. Yeah, so he uh, is. He has a lot of private sector um, experience, and he heads the Intact Center for Climate Change Impacts or Climate Change Adaptation. At it's based or housed at the University of Waterloo, actually. And Intact Insurance is the company that you know funded its startup. And so they, they focus on the insurance industry, and he has a lot of knowledge about that and how the industry is becoming a catalyst for uh, climate change adaptation. And uh, I think he would be really interesting to talk to. He knows a lot. <laughs> do, you, do you know him? Yes, I do. Oh, maybe. Yeah, that sounds right. I haven't done an insurance kind of theme-related podcast. That w would be really interesting. And you know, I just want to follow up. I, I didn't mean to diss your boss or anything. I'm sure be a great guest just for other reasons, too. So. Oh, 100%. <laughs> of course. No. no. Uh, uh, for other, like maybe other projects. So it's not like I'm not extending an invitation. No, if you could make that introduction, that would be great. Again, I haven't. Uh, I, I'm bringing out, I think, some very unusual topics in the in the next few weeks, but that would be a new one. So, no, I like it. That's great. You know how we wrap these podcasts up, but, I mean, thank you so much. I just – if you had – I think, you know, you were a little nervous coming on, but I, you've done fabulous. And I, I hope <laughs> anyone who you work with, if they get a chance to listen to this, you you did them proud. I, I, I've learned a ton about Canada. And, again, you were my first international guest, so, so thank you. But any sort of final words about some of the things that we talked about or any – last parting thoughts no i'm just i i just want to thank you for the podcast like thanks for doing this because we need more and more information on climate change adaptation and something that is easily accessible like i can listen to these podcasts just doing my work and i, th I think that's so amazing and so thank you thanks for doing that and and shining light on all of the different individuals and their organizations across the U.S. and now Canada. So, so good job, Doug. <laughs> well, thank you. That's so sweet. And, you know, I, I can look at my stats and I can see where people are downloading the podcast from different countries and there's an unusual pulse from Ontario. So I'm assuming that oh. has something to do with you because I know you share on occasion, you have a newsletter that you put out and yes, a little plug for that. I mean, anyone can sign up for your newsletter, right? Yeah, that's the climate change community of practice. That's something that we do. It's an interactive online portal. It's essentially the only one of its kind in Canada. We have over 1,600 members. It's free to join. Every month we send out broadcasts. We add new new documents, discussion forums. There's news and articles, and uh, that's where we posted your America Adapts podcast several months ago. So. 
that's probably helped. <laughs> and I'm assuming you'll do another plug for it once this episode comes out, right? <laughs> that's true. Right. <laughs> Depending on when I listen to it and how well I thought I did. <laughs> now, John, even you are marketing this. That's yeah, that's how it works. You've done fine. You've this is great. You did really well. It's uh-huh. going to be a useful episode. And again, seriously, it's it's people are what's happening in Canada. What how our younger generation? This is going to be a valuable episode. So I appreciate it. Okay, thanks. All right, everyone, another phenomenal episode because it's phenomenal because I get to talk to all these really cool people. So uh, uh, thanks for listening in and thanks, Suzanne. But this is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, adapters, welcome back. This is the final part of the episode. This is sort of kind of a wrap up discussion. I've got Dan Ackerstein on again to help me with this wrap up. Hey, Dan, how's it going? It is going quite well, Doug. Thanks for having me. I'm sure many of your fans know who you are, but could you briefly remind the new listeners who Dan Ackerstein is? Of course they do. If anyone out there still doesn't know who I am, I'm Dan Ackerstein. I am a a sustainability consultant. I'm based in Santa Cruz, California. I bring Dan on on occasion to talk about events that have happened during the week and sort of a a follow-up to the the longer interview. And once in a while, he'll say something interesting. So we're going to give it another shot today. Dan, so I... There's an article that I sent to you that I, I wanted to discuss today. It was from Mashable, and I just would like to say, I didn't even know what Mashable really was, but they've really come on strong since the election. You know, I thought they were more just kind of like a tech pop culture kind of website, but they are doing some really interesting political news. It's been fun to see how many websites have, I think, fit that description. I completely agree. I, don't, I didn't know Mashable before the election. I'm a little bit more familiar with them now. What, uh, but I've seen that in, in websites like The Ringer and a few other websites, uh, Deadspin, the sports website. There's just been a lot more sort of people taking, taking the opportunity to say something about politics, which is fantastic. I love it. I think it's great. Well, yeah, it's definitely a different angle on, on some of these things. So anyway, so this article came out. It was shared to me by, uh, actually a previous guest, uh, Jesse Keenan. He's the uh, professor at Harvard University and he sent it to me because, he and I have been having some ongoing discussions about adaptation as an emerging discipline, and he's been doing a lot of the theoretical work around that. And so he sent me this article, and I thought it was fascinating. And it just, I guess, a really quick roundup of the week. This is, <laughs> again, it's week four of the Trump administration, and I don't think it's being political at all to say that the first month was absolutely bonkers. It <laughs> I feel like bonkers is a fair characterization. I think that's just the right adjective. Yeah, I, I could. You could probably even say that. And say you're being neutral, that it was a bonkers first four weeks. So, And I guess some climate change related news is that after, you know, it seemed like several weeks with Scott Pruitt, the Oakland Homa um, guy who finally got confirmed as EPA administrator. That is bad news for a lot of environmentalists. Just based on his record, I, I actually don't know a ton about the man, just but what we've been hearing since he was nominated. But, you know, he, he had sued the EPA on multiple occasions, and now all of a sudden he's the, the administrator of the agency. That's that's probably not going to be good for morale. Not optimistic about his, uh, his plans for the EPA. Right. And so on that note, the article in Mashable talked about what is happening to some of the websites? And we saw this from even day one when Trump came on is like, what's coming down? We saw a little bit of climate change coming down. And so there are groups that are tracking literally word by word what is happening to these federal websites, which I think is just amazing. You know, people think they're just getting away with things. It's no, there's like a whole army of folks. Like if you change one line, we're going to know it. And especially on climate change issues, they're doing it. So this article talked about, some of the changes at the EPA website, but then it got into a broader discussion about adaptation and mitigation and how the EPA potentially might pivot instead of emphasizing mitigation, which for folks who don't really know, mitigation is like, you know, reducing carbon emissions. So the Paris Agreement, everything that's wrong about climate change and global warming is because we have all this carbon going into the air and mitigation is sort of the term associated with like lowering your carbon footprint. And maybe the EPA will pivot and just focus more on adaptation. So, I mean, what what do you think of the article? So I thought the article was fascinating and and for exactly the two reasons that you've noted. The first was the kind of layers of surprise around this dance that's happening with websites. I have never worked in the federal government and I haven't worked for for the government in any capacity when, when websites were quite as common and ubiquitous as they are today. But the idea that 
that there that that the Trump folks came into office and immediately got to work changing websites like that that was item number one on their to do list like we've got to get these websites changed because this is what's shaping the course of U.S. climate policy um, I found hilarious and yet uh, as you observed moments ago there apparently are groups that are monitoring the content of these websites for exactly that reason so perhaps I completely underestimate or misunderestimate the significance that a website has in the making and implementation of public policy. To me, that was all a remarkable chain of events and, and counter events taking place on, on the website issue. I had mentioned this on a previous podcast, but I actually have experience with just this issue, and I don't think it can get me into any legal jeopardy just because what I did was perfectly legitimate. But when I was working for a state, and I won't say which one, but – it rhymes with smarta. We, when there was a change in government, there was there we were giving a heads up that there was a, a big witch hunt on climate change, and so we took down the climate change. Uh, and the higher ups at the agency had no clue about this, but you know we took it down for maintenance and saying, oh, we we got to update some information, which we did. Everything was perfectly legitimate, and we really did that. But uh, we just timed it right around the same time this transition was happening because we convenient. Yes. Yeah, just nothing to do. You know, we, there was no foul intentions there, but uh, I, I could relate. You know, I was involved directly with some of those things. And so I feel bad for these people at EPA. You know, people spend their whole careers and the, the, they're idealists working on to protecting the environment. And then they're told to take things down or put things up that are just quite simply not helpful. It must be very demoralizing there. Absolutely. Yes. On its merits, I completely agree. And at the same time, it, I can't imagine that there are many visitors to these websites on a day-to-day -day basis. And the idea that that is sort of the primary function of the government entity is to maintain a website um, and that the, the change of power, the transfer of power effectively uh, represents the transfer of editorship of a website is, is sort of farcical um, in and of itself. But, you know, it is an important symbolic expression of, of the the entity and its priorities and uh and it certainly is something that's much easier to affect and make a change on than an actual implemented policy or or regulatory structure so by all means and keep in mind since you haven't worked in the federal government and i have you might just see a little bit of content on a website and you're like oh that really doesn't say much but for people that are working there it there there's actually probably a lot of work associated with even getting that verbiage up there. Not so much yeah, that it's sure. there to get up on the website, but it says, oh, we are working on this particular issue. And like, oh, that doesn't seem that you know profound, but there's a t ton of activity. And so if those things are taken down, that means behind the scenes, independent of the website, there are new program objectives. There are new things that these people are going to be asked to do that takes them away from that original mission. So the website in itself, like you said, you know, I don't know too many people that are scrolling the federal websites. Um, you know, some people use it for practical reasons. They're filling out grants and they need that sort of information. But what it does represent is a very kind of tip of the iceberg of, of other work happening within the agency. Yeah. I mean, I think the, 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 the part that's missing for me there is the causality. If you change the program, then obviously you need to change the website. But changing the website has no effect on the program. And I would I would think that if I were the new administrator of an agency, I would be very I'd be much more interested in changing programs than in changing websites. But I'm I'm being petty here. The wow. other part of the article that I thought was really interesting was the adaptation the adaptation mitigation duality and the idea that the administration might embrace adaptation in the absence of mitigation. And the first thing that it made me think of is, again, I'm being very cynical, but a cynical person would think to themselves, this is one of the most time-tested methods of undermining the efficacy of a movement. If you can split it and subdivide the entities that are now closely aligned within that movement, you can blunt its strength and force. And I cannot help but think to myself how many adaptation scientists, how many adaptation uh, focused entities, how many NGOs who support both mitigation and adaptation will now be placed in a situation of potentially having to accept funding for adaptation related projects from an administration who essentially refuses to do any mitigation work. It is 
either nefarious brilliance on their part or perhaps simply something something less sinister but is someone interesting working in the adaptation field I, I guess i was partly encouraged like wow they might work on it more and so yeah i thought that was an interesting part of this too and, and i just want to read this just a little bit from the website which i thought was just fascinating um, the report found that there were several potentially significant changes to epa's climate change section on the portion of the website that focuses on federal partner collaborations most telling is a title change from federal partner collaborations to EPA adaptation collaborations. I mean, a real pivot to adaptation. And just so folks know, when I was working on adaptation of the federal government, like they, it still wasn't getting a lot of traction. The budgets associated with those programs were minuscule. And the biggest difference, and, and I just can't think of my head, top of my head and with all the different agencies, is that on the mitigation side, there was more of a chance where it had a regulatory dimension, whereas adaptation – never had that mm -hmm. and you know it was more like it's the planning or in the the recommendation but like th that is a huge difference and that's probably why there's potentially a pivot of the epa from mitigation adaptation because right now people aren't seeing a lot of regulation associated with adaptation and it doesn't mean that there there shouldn't be you know you're talking sea level rise well there should be a regulation saying you can't do x y and z because of these projected models but yeah i i do think that's a concern but one reason I don't think it's a huge concern quite yet is because I feel like the adaptation side, the camp, has been so tiny anyway that it just, you know, it's not like they were just this big player kept down. They, they, they right. were always still pretty tiny. No, that's definitely the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and, and it's probably not fair for me to represent it as splitting a movement as, as much as it is shaving away a, a constituency within that movement. But all right. So I have a question for you about this. Inherent in the idea that they're embracing adaptation is an acceptance of the idea that the climate is changing in ways that require adaptation. In my mind, that is a significant, that's a significant concession on the part of, of a conservative administration to actually acknowledge the climate is changing so sub significantly that we need to make a, a concerted effort to adapt our our lives to that change. Is it naive for me to think that that is, in fact, a significant concession? Uh, or is that really meaningful? Well, this is where I thought about, like, okay, let's say there is this pivot to adaptation at the EPA that, to me, potentially it's an opportunity. I've, I've been preaching that for a while, is that ultimately I felt like mitigation should become a subset of adaptation anyway as we're lowering our carbon footprint. That's part of our larger uh, adapting to climate change, but it's not that's not where we are right now. But there might be an opportunity for adaptation to kind of be this Trojan horse for mitigation. And, and, and go back to your point, what, there's this sort of concession that, Okay, well, if you're acknowledging that you need to adapt, then there's other forces at work here. What are those forces? How how big are those forces? And you ultimately can't really do adaptation unless you set some metrics down. And so let's say you're talking about sea level rise. Are you talking six inches of sea level rise or three feet? And then it you can't be completely removed from the science when you're even making adaptation decisions. And then looming in all that is the sort of like moral responsibility is that okay you're adapting but if you don't address the mitigation side of it okay are you adapting to 12 inches or are you adapting to 10 feet and right. you need to factor that in and that inevitably is going to come into this adaptation research that i was talking about and to be quite honest sure there's adaptation research but that well, I, I wouldn't even know how to define that and i've been doing this for a while it's still just such a burgeoning field that what is adaptation research and hopefully there's going to be more efforts dedicated to that but you could not do legitimate adaptation unless you're identifying metrics and you're using models that are driving those adaptation decisions and those models are going to give you these different scenarios that all tie back to scenarios associated with temperature rise no oh, right. it one degree is it three degree and those are based on how much carbon is in the atmosphere. So maybe there is a Trojan horse opportunity here over the long run. So that's exactly exactly what I sort of the connections that I that I hoped you would would see there, and that I wasn't being particularly naive about, uh, because I, we, you and I talked earlier this week about an article in the New York Times uh, where they're moving mechanical equipment in buildings, particularly boilers, to the roofs of buildings in New York City, and. That was one that sort of brought it home for me, this idea 
that they are making a decision, an adaptation decision, but it's predicated on a set of climate models that suggest that that building will still be inhabitable. It will just face uh, sea, sea level rise will have a significant consequence for it in storm events. That decision is predicated on information about how much the climate is going to change based on temperature, which is based on emissions. So there is this sense that, okay, we're opening the door to a conversation about the climate changing dramatically. At some point, that conversation necessarily leads us back to a cause. And once we have a cause, we have to we have the capacity to start talking about a, a solution or at least a some sort of, of attempt at a solution. Right. And it, as these government officials start grappling with the kind of specific adaptation decisions that they're going to have to make, and, you know, those are tied with models. You factor in models as you do a lot of adaptation planning. You know, they're going to have to tell their bosses that, okay, well, do you want us to make a recommendation based on your opinion or based on the science? And that that it's going to come down to that, you know, and if it's going to be based right. on your opinion, that information, too, has to be shared. You know, you know we're not going to, you know, talk about drought. We're not going to talk about future water supplies, you know, based on what your wishful thinking is associated with the future climate might be versus like the best that we have now are these models that are only getting better. And if we use those again, it always it's like, you know, you're taking a different path but it always takes you right back to the that that looming deal with the mitigation or you have no control over adaptation all that being said i can't help but hear in in our voices the echo of the five-year plans that were written over and over in the soviet union that were based entirely on the needs of the uh the the folks writing the plans and had no grounding in in weather production, raw materials, climate, any anything that went any of the inputs that went into um, the calculation, and and that of course reminds me of our our fine president's uh, economic growth projections that came out this week, which once again were based on absolutely no inputs and a predetermined output. So they were huge. Yeah, there were some there were some interesting there's some alternative math for sure. Well, and what were you forgetting too? And I, I think the Soviet example is is helpful, but what's for a little so bit, many reasons. <laughs> but what's different, and you know, on a positive note, is that okay, the federal government is not the end all. I want to make a point that the international community is still going to be providing a lot of information, but then you have state and local governments that are going to be doing adaptation planning and their own sort of mitigation programs. And if the federal government is just giving them hooey, they're not going to – I mean they're going to work with universities. They're going to – I mean it's, it, things will adjust and there will be a flow of information. It's absolutely absurd that the federal government isn't taking the leadership role in that. But you know, local governments, as they literally are on the front lines of these decisions, they're, they're going to want the best information. And you know, there's going to be – there might be more of a grassroots demand – to I, I guess to address the looming mitigation problem because adaptation planning is pointless unless you are projecting out like some control over future temperature rise. So right, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but I guess my advice is the more I think about this is that again I feel like adaptation has been the sort of ignored stepsister in the whole climate change discussion, but thanks to podcasts like this, it's getting out there. But if you are on the mitigation side, and I think a lot of science communication is on the mitigation side, my advice to you is start to understand what adaptation is. Get that skill set. I mean, we should all be familiar with our different areas, but I think if you have understood what adaptation is, first of all, you could help people, adaptation practitioners, start thinking about mitigation being baked into what they are doing. There are clever ways to think about these things, and so start thinking about it. Start thinking about adaptation, and it's sort of been a throwaway kind of thing. It's like, what are the climate change impacts, and you just don't go to the next level, which is adapting to those impacts. And my advice is there's been so much energy devoted toward the mitigation side that, you know, maybe be a bit more three-dimensional in your thinking of climate change. Yeah, you know, I have to admit this was this was an interesting exercise for me because so much of the next four years is going to be an adventure in finding silver linings. And this is a moment when I thought to myself, there is a silver lining here. Uh, the climate websites, these, these pages didn't just disappear. They weren't just deleted wholesale. Uh, they were carefully edited. And in fact, they were replaced with something that I think is significant and important. I certainly would have preferred that adaptation 
became, you know, was partnered with, with mitigation enthusiastically, but silver lining and so, I'll take it. As Tim Watkins, who's been on multiple times, we call it silver molecules. We don't, silver linings might be too ambitious. I'll take those too. Right. Okay. On that note, I, some, some good thoughts there. And I think a take home message is that again, the, the adaptation camps and the mitigation camps, shouldn't be split into two that that you know you read the article and you can kind of go there it takes you there and you're like uh oh um i i hope it's an opportunity for more collaboration and you know there has been a, that originally when adaptation kind of came out you know even 10 15 years ago there was like why are we even talking about adaptation we need to focus on mitigation we yeah. could revisit those conversations again and that would be silly anyone who's dealing with adaptation now we've talked about it on this podcast is like we shrug and we just were dumbfounded to think that we somehow don't want to focus on mitigation when we're focusing on the adaptation side. Don't split us into those camps. So, mm -hmm. all right. Any final thoughts, Mr. Ackerstein? That's it for me. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to see the Trump administration getting so progressive on these issues I care about. So the, Oh wait, I'm thrilled <laughs> to see the Trump administration understands how to update a website. I'm still reeling from that press conference from last week. I don't know when people people should hear this soon, but that was whoo. That was uh, magnificent. Yeah, that was that was you know it's, again it's it's unusual time. So uh, here we are reporting on it. Okay, on that note, everyone, this is the well. No, stick around. I've got some wrap up comments that I want to say, but I'll do that in a little bit. But thanks again, Dan. Thanks for coming on. We'll we'll talk to you next time. But to everyone, Dad, this is America Apps. That is a wrap for this week's episode of America at Apps, the Climate Change Podcast. Thank you so much to Suzanne Pardo for coming on and talking about Canada, talking about what it means to be a millennial and how adaptation is now this sort of career opportunity for, for younger professionals. I thought it was very interesting on how, how she kind of came through all that. Also, thanks to Dan Ackerstein for coming on and having a frank discussion about what's happening at the federal agencies, what's happening on some of those websites, and how there might be a pivot from mitigation to adaptation and the potential threat of cleaving mitigation and adaptation into two climate change camps. We have to be on the lookout for that. Don't forget, you can join the Facebook page at America Daps. There's a community group, and there's just a general Facebook page. I love when you guys go there and post things. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and any other way that you listen to a podcast. There's all sorts of great ways that you can listen to a podcast. Please, podcasts survive and they thrive by word of mouth. And so I know some of you who are regular listeners, just, yeah, let your friends know or share. I usually share it on Facebook or share a link to the actual the podcast itself where people can listen to it. And yeah, just the word of mouth is how people hear about these things. And so it'd be much appreciated. You're sitting there, you're looking at your phone like, oh yeah, I can go send this out to this person or this listserv. And um, yeah, that would be much appreciated. Again, visit the website, americadaps.org. If you have any questions, if you're interested in hearing me speak at conferences, I have a lot of adaptation stories to tell. And so it's something I... I do have uh, much experience with public speaking, so if you're out there uh, organizing a conference or panel, let me know. Contact me at americadaps at gmail.com, and don't forget there's opportunity to support the podcast. There's a PayPal option on the website. Okay, on that note, next week I have John Sutter from CNN's Two Degrees coming on. I'm very excited about this conversation. He's gone out in the field quite a bit, and he's talked to people about what climate change might mean for them, and he's going to come on. And we're going to have a discussion of his experiences and hopefully opportunities for the wider climate change universe to sort of emphasize adaptation. I'm very excited about my conversation with John. On that note, I hope all of you have a fantastic day and a great week.